In 1989, Maxis Studio released the first game in a genre that became known as city building simulations, SimCity. The game was a financial success and sold well above expectations and was hailed by games media as an instructive game in the fields of urban planning, politics and economics. The core gameplay hasn't changed in subsequent releases, the last one being SimCity 2013. By then, it had however become apparent in the city building community that many concepts no longer accurately reflected new approaches and current problems in urban planning. When SimCity designer Will Wright worked on the original SimCity starting in 1985, he got his inspiration from a 1969 book called Urban Dynamics by J.W. Forrester. At the time of release of the last SimCity game in 2013, this was 44 year old research. In March 2015, a new city building game was released, with great hype. City Skylines by Finnish developer Colossal Order and published by the Swedish company Paradox Interactive. Could these European companies bring about the change needed after five decades of outdated premises in city building games? Is City Skylines actually a realistic city building game? To answer this question, we will first have to examine the core gameplay loop. The player places roads, sets zones and constructs public buildings. Before we do that, however, let me quickly preface this video by making you aware that I will put small numbers on screen that correspond to academic literature linked in the video description. For me as a researcher in urban geography, it is important to provide meaningful and accurate information. This is a lot of work, so if you appreciate that, make sure to give the video a like and subscribe to my channel for more city skylines and urban planning video essays. Okay then, let's start with the first point, player autonomy. This is where the first difference to real life urban planning becomes apparent. The player is fully independent in his decisions on where and how to place roads, public buildings, zoning, and due to gameplay considerations, acts completely autonomous. The SimCity series has advisors, but they do not have any judicial power over the player. In City Skylines, the player mayor has no advisors and is not held accountable by other political entities or planning laws. There is no city council, no municipal or regional politics, no workers unions, no citizen interest groups. Let's compare that to a very much simplified overview of the German urban planning federal framework. This graphic displays the federal government on top, states below that, regional planning committees below these, and second to last, the city government. But wait, there's more. This is what it looks like within a city's organizational structure. If you're not into urban planning law, does that look like fun for the average city simulation player? What is fun though, is watching all the cars whiz by on your nicely planned road. Or how about that beautiful highway interchange? Though cool to look at, this way of planning our cities in real life is unsustainable. The car first approach is no longer a viable way of tackling our traffic problems and urban living, and it's no longer advised by researchers. But as is often the case, there is a disconnect between the news research and actual implementation. City Skylines provides more options for roads than for pedestrian, cycling and public transport infrastructure combined without the DLC that is. While there are options for small, medium and large roads, the same can't be said for sidewalk width or sidewalk and cycle path configurations. Without the scene workshop, players wouldn't have access to pedestrian only roads that are zonable, similar to what you would see in European city core shopping streets or new types of pedestrian focused communities. Another issue with the road infrastructure in city skylines is that it is way too cheap. We're not only talking about its construction cost. If we want to deal with infrastructure from a contemporary point of view, we also have to consider its maintenance and further hidden costs. For example, the more roads, the more accidents, the higher the necessary police budget. This so-called negative externality is not represented in game. The amount of roads, 
does not correlate to the police budget in City Skylines. Let's have a look at the third main gameplay loop in city building simulations, zoning. When discussing this topic, we have to consider two things. First, most cities in the world were built prior to any type of zoning code. However, this can't be considered for city skylines because in game we always build cities completely new. Second, as with all simulations, certain simplifications have to be made. The degree to which this happens is variable, however. With that out of the way, let's actually have a look at how zoning works in city skylines. There is residential and commercial zones with two densities each, low and high. Additionally, we have industry and offices, farming, forestry, mining and drilling. In this case, no density options though. That's 10 zoning options in total, excluding district specializations such as eco buildings, IT clusters or tourism. More on that shortly. The obvious thing missing is medium density options for residential and commercial, as well as any density options at all for office and industry. Compared to most cities zoning code with over 30 or more options, that doesn't allow the player much specificity in designing their districts. Oh, and mixed use zoning is not available in city skylines at all. But let's go back to district specializations. Different uses can indeed be permitted, prohibited or specified in zoning codes. But there are other ways to regulate buildings than just zoning. What makes eco houses different from other single family houses in city skylines? Fundamentally, they are still zoned as low density residential. Roof shape, setbacks from the road or floor area ratio, FAR for short, are other ways to specify how a building should look apart from zoning. These specifications cannot be set in game. After examining the three core game concepts, let me continue with a random assortment of other things that are different between actual urban planning and city building simulation games. Well, the list actually isn't that random. I want to start with parking as the next important concept in this video, because it actually is a huge deal in real life. For most people, parking is just there. You drive to a grocery store and park your car in front. You get home from work and park your car in the street in front of your house. Or you want to go to a doctor's appointment but just can't find any empty parking spot and are annoyed. However, for planners, architects and researchers, parking is much more complex. While there is parking in city skylines and traffic AI in-game actually is able to use parking spots correctly, this feature has been drastically dialed down. A developer stated in an interview that they had to do this because the game would otherwise end up being a parking lot simulator. I mean, Germans would still play it, I guess? Anyways, cars need parking spaces. Bikes do too, but they take way less space. So let's continue focusing on car parking. Generally, most cars sit in a parking spot for 90% of their life cycle. And cars are getting bigger due to more safety features and consumer demands. So the space cars utilize, apart from roads, is pretty big. Roughly 30% of a city's area is devoted to parking in the US. Retail often requires a 2 to 1 ratio of parking square footage to retail square footage. Granted, these are American and hypercar focused examples, but the point still stands. Cars produce a huge negative externality with their demand for space that could otherwise be devoted for buildings or nature. But the developer most likely was right, that wouldn't be fun for the player to account for or to look at. To that I say however, show the players how detrimental cars are to good urban core fabric. If we as urban planners and as gamers want our cities to become livable in real life and to make people aware of the issues, we have to bring them up and show them in game. When there's plenty of traffic on a road, how do you fix that? You would of course say, add more lanes. Sadly, this doesn't work in real life due to a concept known as induced demand. I might do a video on that in the future. However, much of city skylines focuses on simple solutions like that. That sound reasonable at first. High crime rate, build more police stations. There are no options comparable to youth after school programs municipal homeless shelters, 
and other options to reduce crime. Only police and education will reduce it. This is highly simplified and ignores a huge chunk of sociology and psychology research that has seeped into urban planning in recent years, specifically from the Copenhagen School of Urban Planning. Concerning simple solutions, the game does not deal with poverty at all. Building levels in-game are only really a very abstract form of that. In real-life urban planning, it is a big deal to provide housing for all levels of society. Public housing projects, lower-income neighborhoods and so on have different requirements than other districts in the city. No city will ever become as homogeneous as a full residential level 5 city skyline one. Also, building schools, hospitals and other public services won't magically increase citizens' incomes. Now this whole video focused on stuff that city skylines did badly or didn't even tackle. But let me finish this video by saying that this was actually a love letter to the game. It is the best city building simulation game released so far, initially made by a team of only 14 people. Additionally, the large modding community allows all of us players to customize how in-depth we want the systems in-game to be. Thank you for watching this video essay. If you want to listen to more of my unscripted ramblings on urban planning stuff, feel free to give me a follow over on twitch.tv slash